Uh, so I'm Tom, and I will be presenting our work, well, the work that me and my colleague Victor over there uh, were doing. Uh, so it's on uh, well, security analysis of mobile-first sites. Um, so mobile-first sites are sites that are specifically developed for uh, mobile users. So for instance, if you go to twitter.com, you might, and well, with your mobile device, you will end up on mobile.twitter.com which is, well, actually a different site than the, uh, well, regular twitter.com that you would see when you would visit the site with your desktop browser. Uh, so usually they're hosted on a different subdomain, so uh, usually m.example.com, uh, like m.facebook.com, m.whatever. And um, so, well, it's, like uh, already a fun anecdote that we discovered during our research is when we were looking into things, uh, we found that this uh, mobile version of these sites were already being used as kind of uh, phishing attempts. So instead of the dot, they would uh, put a hyphen and then it would look to users that they would be on twitter.com, amazon.com and so on. Uh, so, for instance, yeah, m-amazon.com is hosting some kind of yeah, scam and malware stuff. So, um, if by accident you would type it incorrectly or something, then you would end up uh, on a site like this. Um, so, yeah, it would well try to get uh, you to uh, accept the notifications, and when you reject it, you're forward to another site and. So here the, the redirects happen very fast because I uh, blocked them already. Um, but yeah, usually the, well, and you can see that eventually you end up on some malicious sites. And most likely the previous sites were also, mas were also malicious, but they weren't caught by the firewall over here. So I did this recording today. That's why you see the rye there. Uh, but anyway, um, these mobile-first sites, um, they're typically developed several years after the desktop version. Um, so we try to get like an estimate of how much time is in between the development of the both sites. And we found that in a median, um, a mobile version of a site is developed around 6.8 years, so almost seven years after the desktop site. And we used these mementos to find the first occurrence of the desktop or the mobile site. Um, and this uh, allows us to, well, this kind of creates a unique viewpoint on uh, how security is applied. Because we have two assets of uh, the same company or same organization that, or like web assets that are developed one like typically seven years before the other. Um, so that's kind of creates a unique viewpoint. So if we make the assumption that um, if a website is developed several years later and uh, security is applied at design time, then these websites that are created later, so the mobile version of the site, they should contain uh, newer security features than uh, these other sites. Um, so when we talk about web security, um, we can kind of summarize it as two things. So, um, yeah, you have either the good, well, the vulnerabilities and also the um, security uh, features that try to mitigate them. So either they will completely mitigate it. Uh, so for instance, if you set, or if you correctly set the Xframe options header, then, uh, well, you will be safeguarded from uh, click checking attacks or it will try to uh, counter the or limit the consequences. So if you set the HTTP only attribute on a cookie, then this cookie cannot be stolen uh, through cross-site scripting attacks. Um, so what we wanted to figure out in our study is whether these, these security mechanisms, whether they're applied um, well, um, ad hoc, so after an um, application has been developed, or uh, at uh, during the design time, and um, yeah, how are they applied? So is it 
uh, like only w will a website only configure a security feature for certain aspects, or will it do it across uh, all its uh, endpoints? Um, so, in order to figure this out, we did uh, four-legged. Uh, well, our research consisted of four different parts. Uh, so first, we wanted to find these mobile-first sites. Uh, in the second step, we then try to obtain the different kind of features. Uh, I'll go into uh, more into detail later what these features are and how they try to capture the security hygiene of a website. Uh, the third part of our study was a more statistical analysis. Uh, where we compare the security of mobile sites versus their desktop counterpart and vice versa. And then in a later stage, we also looked into more detail into certain security features on how they are adopted. So the first part of our study was to find mobile first sites. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we uh, well visited websites with uh, two browsers. So we have our own crawling infrastructure, uh, which is based on uh, headless Chrome or headless Chromium. And uh, in the one part, it was the, the basic one. And in the other one, we uh, made the, well, the browser appear as if it was a mobile browser. So we changed the user agent string. Uh, we emulated different screen dimensions uh, and so on. And so we visited uh, one million websites, and um, we captured uh, the redirects that were occurring uh, for these both browsers. So if the redirect uh, happened, uh, if, if the user was redirected to a different domain or a different subdomain on the mobile client than on the desktop client, we considered this as a potential uh, mobile site. Um, so we used the uh, well, top one million uh, Tranco sites, which is a research-oriented list for most popular websites, and uh, we found that uh, well, a bit over 15,000 websites of these one million sites uh, redirected uh, users to a different domain or subdomain uh, when they were visiting over uh, mobile versus when they were visiting over desktop. Um, but for well, to kind of clean up our data, we had to filter uh, the websites that were kind of irrelevant. So some of them uh, redirected users directly to the Google Play Store uh, to kind of trigger them to install the application rather than just serving the mobile version of their website. Um, yeah, some of them uh, the, where the website was not accessible some of them were empty. Um, then there were also some duplicates. So yeah, like google.com and google.nl, we only considered one uh, Google there. Um, and yeah, we tried to find these by using uh, like a perceptual hash. And then we clustered all the different groups. And that's how we managed to figure out the duplicate sites. Um, and yeah, in the end, there were also uh, 512 sites that we found that were compromised. Um, and I'll go into more detail in the next slide. But so in total, uh, we found 10,222 sites that had uh, a desktop version and a mobile version that was served on a different domain or a different subdomain than the desktop version. And these are all like unique sites. But so, well, another anecdote is that we found during this filtering process uh, 512 uh, compromised sites. And I manually looked into it, and I actually managed to obtain the source code of one of these compromised sites. Um, so what happened was if I, as a mob with my mobile browser, would visit one of these sites, I would get redirected to this uh, www.type.ru are you, which is like a kind of suspicious site, and this site would redirect me uh, to some porn sites. 
uh, with with some affiliate affiliate uh, number, such that they might get some revenue out of this. Um, but by observing the the source codes that I obtained from one of these sites, uh, I figured that it was most likely that this compromise was related to uh, vulnerability in uh, some WordPress WordPress plugin, and well, after exploiting this vulnerability, the attacker uploaded an HD access um, file to the root of this domain. And then when this uh, HD access would check for the mobile string in the user agent string, and if this was present, it would redirect the user. So this type of malware, I think, um, the well, it tries to like hide uh, or hide from the administrators because an admi administrator might be more likely to figure out that something is or something bad is happening on their site when they are vis well when they visit it over their desktop site but it might be well less likely that uh, mobile users uh, would uh, well that the administrator would figure it out when it's only mobile users who are being redirected Okay, um, so that brings us to the second part of our study, uh, obtaining the different features uh, that capture the security hygiene. Um, so the security of a website can be considered as like the, the vulnerabilities that it contains and the defense mechanisms that are used to prevent them um, or to harden the website against them. Um, so what we could do is we could try to find vulnerabilities at a very large scale to figure out all the different vulnerabilities. Uh, but this is very difficult, especially from an academic perspective, um, because, well, already by just crawling sites, we get certain complaints of companies that think that we are somehow abusing them. Um, and then if we would run actual attacks against sites, well, that also wouldn't be very ethical. Um, and also, uh, if there was this uh, universal technique to uh, detect vulnerabilities, everyone would be doing this, and we, well, was probably wouldn't need to exist uh, because there, well, all vulnerabilities could be detected and fixed. Uh, so it's often very site-specific, so it's di very difficult to find all these different uh, vulnerabilities. So that's why we went a different way. So we tried to focus more on the defense mechanisms that were used. Um, so the usage of these mechanisms is typically recommended by browser vendors and other organizations such as OWASP. And um, it makes it also much easier for us as researchers to observe the, the usage and adoption of them because these mechanisms need to be communicated to the browser, and uh, that allows us to just capture these uh, typically through like a response header. Um, and yeah, it allows us to uh, capture all the different features that are being used. Um, so I won't go into detail on all the features, but I just want to show that we covered like different classes of um, security mechanisms that counter um, well, different types of vulnerabilities. So the HTTP only attribute and the, the content security policy, um, which are like either an attribute on the cookie or, or um, in the case of content security policy, a new response header. Um, we also did look in, well through the DOM uh, to find forms um, that contained a CSRF token to prevent uh, CSERF type of attacks. Um, of course, um, in our study, we didn't log into or register and log into sites. Uh, so these CSERF tokens would only defend against login CSERF attacks. Um, yeah, and then the click checking defenses. Um, quite, well, some other things like MIME sniffing attacks. Um, that can be defended against by the X content type option header. Um, quite some uh, features uh, that, well, we're trying to tackle the man in the middle attacks. Um, so we already considered using uh, HTTPS as a 
good security practice. Um, and well, that's important to remember if you look at the, the numbers later on. Um, and then, yeah, some others like the secure attribute on cookie, uh, the strict transport security headers, um, and so on. And then also some um, things that can possibly go wrong, um, like uh, mixed content inclusion. So when we are on, on an HTTPS page and we include a resource that's loaded over HTTP, uh, that's mixed content. Then SSL stripping where, um, well, that's like a vulnerability where uh, the page is loaded over HTTP, but then uh, there's a form that links to HTTPS, uh, but as an attacker we can modify this uh, resource over HTTP and strip out the S such that the form will still be submitted over HTTP. Um, and yeah. Then finally, um, yeah, also some other things like the sandbox attribute on iframes, um, which well, can be used to determine what an iframe is allowed to do. And then there's, well, uh, sub-resource integrity, uh, which is the integrity attribute. And here we mainly looked for uh, this attribute on scripts. Um, and then finally, the referrer policy, which kind of gives control to the web developer on which referrer headers will be sent to third parties. So an important note that I should make is that, um, well, if you're developing an application, you don't necessarily need to implement all of these different features. Um, it often depends on um, well, the type of, char well, the characteristics of your application and um, the yeah, specific functionality that you offer. Um, so for instance, if you don't have any forms or any actions that's, um, well, uh, can do harm, then, well, defending against a C server tech, well, there, yeah, wouldn't be uh, something that you would have to do. Um, or you could allow web pages to frame you if uh, that's part of the functionality that you provide. So then you wouldn't have this X-frame options header. Um, but in general, uh, we wanted to capture the, the the security consciousness of the web developers, and mainly uh, the difference between uh, the adoption of security features between the mobile and the desktop version. So um, we we want to see if well web developers actually considered using one of these features. So in total, we checked for 11 defense mechanisms and uh, four potential weaknesses. Uh, so these are not actual vulnerabilities, but in some cases they might be, uh, so we consider them uh, potential uh, weaknesses. And then we well, actually obtained the, the data by visiting up to 20 pages per site, and that's both on a desktop browser and a mobile browser, so the emulated mobile browser. Um, and yeah, we used our uh, customized uh, crawler infrastructure that we built at our uh, research uh, group. And then after we obtained all the data, we could actually start performing some uh, statistical analysis. Um, like the first thing that we looked at was uh, the number of features that websites would uh, uh, deploy. So, um, well, the, the most interesting thing to look at on this graph is the, the well, the bars at uh, the point zero. Uh, so there you can already see that there are fewer desktop sites that do not have any of these security features compared to the mobile sites. And then. When we move more towards the right, so uh, more s well websites with more uh, security features implemented, we can see that um, well the desktop typically has a lot more or not a lot more, but well consistently more uh, security features implemented than the uh, mobile counterpart. But well, this is like a very rudimentary thing. Um, 
so we wanted to figure out whether mobile sites are actually more or less secure than their desktop counterpart. And also which uh, well security features are more or less prevalent on mobile sites uh, also compared to their desktop uh, version. Um, and finally, um, we want to know whether these uh, the efforts that are being made to adopt these features are um, because of the web developer that made them or because of some other uh, influences. Um, so we used the Wilcoxon signed rank test, uh, which is a statistical, anal well, a statistical test for paired samples. And that's good for us because we have these paired samples, so we have the mobile version and the desktop version. And it also does not rely on a, a priori assumption of the data distribution, uh, which is also good because we, well, don't have this. Um, and um, yeah, so we use this test and then we also performed a mediation analysis uh, because um, uh, more complex websites might have uh, more features just because it's more complex. Um, and uh, so we wanted to consider what the effect of this complexity is. Although complexity is a rather vague term. Um, so in our analysis, we considered um, complexity as something feature specific. So for instance, for the HTTP only attribute on cookies, we considered complexity as something in terms of the number of cookies that are being set on the site. And well, then we did all this uh, statistical analysis and we got this very nice big table. Um, so I, I won't even try to uh, well, tell you where to look at, uh, but uh, what we can summarize this table as is that uh, we found that um, security features are more prevalent on desktop sites, which we already saw in our uh, bar chart uh, before. And um, especially for uh, features related to man-in-the-middle defenses, uh, the effect of the device, so the fact that, you're the, that it's a desktop site um, has a, the biggest effect. Um, so for most features, however, um, the effect of whether it's the mobile version of the de or the desktop version is um, well very limited and often statistically insignificant. Um, so this kind of shows that there is a somewhat consistent apl well, application of these security features across uh, the mobile and desktop version of the site. And our um, mediation analysis showed um, that, um, well, there is an impact of the complexity on um, on the um, the adoption of these features. So, for instance, uh, sites with more cookies, uh, or like, for instance, we saw that desktop sites had more cookies, and therefore they were also more likely. Uh, to have this HTTP only or secure attribute on one of these cookies. Um, and then when we look at the different features separately, um, we can see that um, well, overall the adoption of these is very low. So um, you can, s well, the, the exception is the usage of HTTPS, which now around 60 or 70 percent of the sites are that we considered were uh, deploying. Um, but then for the other features, uh, we see that, well, the adoption is fairly low. So yeah, almost all of them, except the HTTP only attribute, um, like all of them were less than 20% of the sites that uh, use it. Um, and what you can also see on this figure is that uh, the the number of features where there's a, an overlap of um, where both the mobile as desktop version are using it uh, is, well, relatively high with 
a few exceptions, such as the HTTP only attribute, where we see uh, lo well, more desktop sites are using it compared to the mobile version. Um, but this can likely be attributed to uh, the type of framework that uh, is being used. Uh, but that I will be talking about a bit later in this presentation. And that brings me to the fourth part of our study, so the in-depth analysis. Um, and we looked into more depth in uh, two uh, specific security features, namely uh, content security policy, uh, because it's a very diverse and complex mechanism. And uh, well, it has an impact on many different uh, site features. And there was also a, a prior study in 2016 that focused specifically on uh, content security policy, so that allows us to compare with this previous study. And um, we also looked at the adoption of HTTPS because well, most sites have HTTPS adopted. And it's also the feature where we found the most effect of which version of the site was being shown. So for content security policy, uh, we found 502 sites or desktop sites that were using it and uh, 482 sites. So that's not that much uh, in total. So I think around 5%, uh, a bit less. Um, but what we saw is that when content security policy is defined, most uh, sites enable it on all the different pages of their um, of their sites. So both for the desktop, where we found around 82% uh, of the pages that were covered when CSP was uh, enabled, and uh, yeah, something similar for mobile. And we also what was also interesting is that we found that um, on more than 90% of the pages, so when CSP was deployed, we found that the same policy was applied um, throughout the entire site. But then uh, we looked into uh, like the usefulness of these, um, of these policies, uh, in particular to defend against uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Um, and so we uh, well, ran all of these policies through uh, the Google's Content Security Policy Evaluator. Um, you, well, you can just Google for this um, and you will f find it. So you basically tell it, um, um, you give it uh, a content security policy and it will tell you whether you, there are any issues with it. Um, and what we found is that almost all, so there's only two exceptions for desktop and three for mobile, uh, they all had high severity issues uh, with their uh, policy. Um, and most of them was related to the unsafe inline uh, property. So then when we want to compare with um, a study from 2016 to kind of see how CSP is evolving. Uh, we can see that um, in our study, the, the default source, so the second line there, uh, was only used by around 34% of the sites, whereas in the previous study, they found that 85% of the sites were using it. Um, I, I should note that uh, this study from 2016 um, was also by people from Google. Um, it's based on a different data set, so the, that might explain to some extent why we see different things. Um, but I think that the, the evolution can still be seen there. Um, and what's also quite interesting is that these newer features, um, like the newer uh, directive, such as block all mixed content and refer and frame ancestors, are being used a lot more than uh, so three years ago, or three and a half years ago. Um, so I think that's well, a quite interesting finding. And then moving on to uh, the analysis of uh, the adoption of HTTPS. Um, so we found around 62% of the sites 
we're using uh, HTTPS on both the mobile as well as the desktop version. And most of them, so around 70% of these 62%, uh, had a, a secure implementation on both sides. Um, however, uh, there were uh, 665 desktop sites that were secure where the mobile version was insecure or had some issues. Um, and that was mainly related to uh, the mobile version automatically redirecting to HTTP. And around, uh, well, for around half of that, we saw the inverse, so where the mobile version was um, secure, whereas the desktop version was not. Uh, and that was mainly related because there was some mixed content inclusion on the desktop uh, part. Um, and yeah, here you can see this in graph form. So you can see the, um, well, the light blue line going from secure on the left side, so the desktop version, to, um, to redirect to HP on the right side. And also the HP resources, uh, the darker blue one uh, from the desktop flowing to the secure one on the mobile. So we did all of these analyses, so what can we like conclude from this? Um, so we found that the adoption of security mechanisms is quite similar on the mobile as well as the desktop version. Um, so both in terms of which security mechanisms are being used as well as um, how, are, how they are being used uh, or how they are being implemented. And from this we can, well, if our previous assumption holds that um, a newer site will have newer security mechanisms if security is considered at design time, we can like say that this hypothesis is not valid because we saw that um, there is a similar adoption of the security mechanisms. So it's most likely that security is, applied, uh, is um, well, it's used as something reactively. Um, so um, when, we, when you already have a website and afterwards you decide, now I want to employ some uh, security mechanisms. And then uh, we also found that overall mobile sites have uh, well fewer security mechanisms, um, which might be because they don't really need need it, or there might be less interest in securing them. And also, what's kind of sad is that the adoption of security features is uh, quite low. And then, when we actually look at the attribution of the security feature, so when we try to figure out whether it was because of the, um, um, the efforts made by the web developer that this mechanism was deployed or by something else. Uh, we actually found that uh, many uh, features such as the HTTP only attributes on cookies were related uh, or were there because um, the um, because the website was using a framework such as WordPress and WordPress by default sets the HTTP only attribute on cookies. So this means that um, that ac actually um, the adoption is uh, even lower. Um, so there's still some work to be done in this attribution because it's not straightforward uh, because um, the presence of a security feature can depend on many different things. Um, it might be the web stack that adds it there, or uh, certain third-party libraries, or uh, other type of scripts that uh, make the feature to be there. Um, and this can be either d direct, so um, in case of uh, WordPress, or indirect uh, through some um, well, other third parties that add it. Um, but it, it is important if we want to capture the security efforts that are being made by the different um, websites. And um, so that means that the, the conscience uh, security decisions that are made by the security 
uh, by the web developers is even lower than this 5 to 20 percent that we reported in our study. And well, that's yeah, quite sad. But how do we move on from here? Um, so what are the, the good things about what we found? Um, so we found that actually sites that are using um, WordPress, for instance, they will, almost all of them will have this HTTP only attribute. Um, so that got me thinking, like when, I, when someone would create a new website, well, if they don't consider um, any of these, um, sorry, um, so when someone is creating a new website, wouldn't it be nice if you would start from already a more secure version? And then if you would need to, uh, well, so for instance, a more secure ver version would already adopt all of these different security mechanisms, or at least a selection of them. And if you would uh, somehow, somewhat, somehow have to make an exception, uh, because these security features are blocking what you want to do, or want to achieve, then you already make the web developer think about the, the change that they are doing, uh, and then the potential consequences of making this change. Um, so, well, I think this would be nice to have, uh, but it's a bit tricky because uh, security features are constantly being added. Uh, well, new security features are being added and Existing features, like for instance CSP, are also being ch being changed. Uh, so it's difficult to figure out uh, how to start from a, well, a secure version of uh, what a website would have to look like. Um, but still, uh, even if you don't consider everything, it's still significantly better than not having anything at all. Um, so what else can we do? So we know that websites will likely have some vulnerabilities. I don't think anyone will claim that their website is 100% secure. Um, so what we can do is we should try to make exploitation more difficult or impossible uh, or um, for the attacker by, for instance, uh, employing one of these security mechanisms. Another thing that we can do uh, and th I think that's an important takeaway of this presentation is that we should try to reduce the, the threat surface that users are facing. So for instance, if you have a mobile website, then it wouldn't make any sense to expose desktop users to this mobile site because any vulnerability in, one of th in the mobile version of the site would affect or should only affect uh, mobile users. And the same for, well, desktop, well, vulnerabilities in the desktop side should only uh, be affecting uh, desktop users. So um, it's uh, very simple to, um, based on the user agent string, detect whether the current user is a, on a mobile device or a desktop device. So we should already um, make sure that desktop users cannot just be, uh, well, cannot simply browse to the mobile version. Um, so if we just have some redirects uh, beforehand, that would already uh, prevent these users from uh, being exploited. So that brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. Um, so we performed this large-scale uh, comparative study on uh, mobile-first sites. And this kind of provided us with a unique for viewpoint because mobile sites are typically developed year years after uh, or several years after um, the desktop site. Um, we found that desktop sites have a slightly higher adoption of security features, but in general, the adoption of security mechanisms is still uh, well, quite low. Um, Although we did find that when a security feature is being adopted, it's typically universally adopted across all assets of um, a website. Um, and we also have some indications that 
the usage of these uh, mechanisms is uh, not considered during design time, but only applied retroactively. And um, yeah, so the, we also found that by having more complexity, uh, websites are also more likely to have one of these features. Uh, and also it's sometimes quite difficult to attribute who uh, made this feature to be there. Uh, so uh, there's still some work to be done in order to correctly attribute uh, the presence of a cer certain security feature to the efforts that are made by the web developers. Um, overall, yeah, the, the, the adoption of these mechanisms is quite low, um, but moving onwards, it would be nice if we can have um, some mechanisms where we have a secure, well, where we start from a secure point and then develop uh, applications starting from there, uh, rather than the other way around by first making an application and then trying to secure it. Um, and then, well, the last thing would be uh, that you shouldn't or should try to uh, not expose users to unnecessary threats by, for instance, redirecting desktop users to the desktop site automatically. Um, so we did a bit more of, uh, well, there's more details to be found. Um, and I would like to invite you to take a look at our paper. Uh, which you can find on this link. Um, and with that, I would happily answer any of your questions. Um, <coughs> what kind of um, uh, simulator did you use for mobile sites? Uh, how do you mean simulator? I would, what, what for... Um, what, uh, what for... Uh, what for browser? Uh, so we used uh, headless Chromium, and um, so um, we we used the simulator that's built into Chromium. So um, you can also just use Chrome and then uh, open the developer tools and then uh, it uses this. And then we made some custom modifications to make sure that websites would detect it as a mobile site. Uh, nice research. Uh, did you try to um, reach the, those owners uh, with the biggest issues? Um, well, we, we didn't really look for issues. Um, so the lack of usage of these uh, mechanisms is not necessarily an issue. Um, so you can have, if your website would be perfectly safe and secure and there would be no vulnerabilities, then it's not well, strictly necessarily necessary to use one of these features. Um, so we yeah, mainly looked at um, like the positive side, uh, which turned out to not be that positive. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, really nice research. Uh, I was wondering, since you did a lot of crawling, did you mainly look at public sites without uh, where you are not logged in, because I'm wondering if that could make a difference regarding if there's no session cookie, then maybe the cookies, there are less protection measures for the cookies. Yeah, I, I think it would definitely be interesting to also look into um, well the logged in version of the sites. Uh, however, creating accounts for 10,000 sites and automatically logging into them, well, it might be feasible, but it's not that trivial. Uh, so we unfortunately couldn't look into that. Uh, but I do think that uh, by doing so, we would probably find some different things. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, I'm sure you'll take questions afterwards. I'll be fast. Um, <coughs> you got my attention when you were talking about the redirects. Um, what I noticed quite a lot are the, the redirects to malicious sites due to malvertising. Did you get any interesting insights during your research into this thing? Um, how would you, or which, did you mean the, like the um, Amazon.com type of thing or? For, for instance, if, even if I visit a legitimate website, like news site or something similar, are, 
I sometimes get redirected to malicious site due to an ad, due to a malicious ad. So <clears throat> my question would be, did you also notice such a behavior during uh, your research? Was it a bit? Was it a lot? Not at all? Um, um, well, in, in this research, we didn't encounter, as far as I know, any malicious advertisement, uh, although we also didn't actively look for it. Um, but we have well, current ongoing research that looks specifically into uh, malvertising and type kind of try to figure out the entire ecosystem. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Um, the keynote, the end of the day keynote is uh, downstairs now in 10 minutes. Um, thanks, Tom.